no, this is why I should have just gone with the, the, the original plan. But resilience is what we're going to talk about. So they're going to mess with that, and I'm going to keep giving the talk, and you're just going to have to imagine pictures if we don't get them up. Um, at, the problem with speaking late in the conference is everybody steals your good ideas, and Theo and Rob already gave like a third of this talk. So that's kind of exciting for me, but it also means that I'm right on topic when we talk about how to do resilience. So what I'm going to say is there are no Waffle Houses in Baltimore, so here's the thing you need to understand about Waffle House. It never closes. Waffle House never closes. They practically don't have locks on the door because they don't close for Christmas, and they don't close for New Year's, and they do sometimes close for hurricanes. So how do you close a store that never closes? I'm going to try and do this in a way that involves cute kitties. And they're going to try and pull up my slides on the other computer. Sorry about this. OK. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is disaster and failure. And I think it's really important to understand that failure is an everyday occurrence. We have small failures every day. And that's OK. That's, that's part of our failure budget, right? The thing that I'm really worried about is the way that the more failures you have, the more you end up with in a disaster. There we go. I have, I have notes. I don't know what your problem is. Um, any single failure can be overcome, but when you start adding failure on failure, your chances for a disaster, or in D&D terms, a critical failure, really increase. So I want to tell you about the summer after my freshman year, and I was in Alaska. And it was, uh, you would think, beautiful and scenic. Like, you've all seen pictures of Alaska. It's beautiful and scenic, and there's, like, Denali and gorgeous stuff like that. But it turns out that I was working in Anchorage at the busiest Wendy's in Anchorage. And you wouldn't think it would be that busy, but I'm telling you they have an Air Force base. So it was kind of busy. And I was pretty good at doing this um, during the days. At night, I worked as a pool hall waitress. <laughs> and I would sit there with a cash tray of $2,000 by the end of lunch rush, sitting on the counter, making change out of it through the drive through And one day, the power went out during lunch rush. And I was like, so do we close? What, what happens now? Like, there's no power. And my manager was like, no, we don't close. We don't make any Frosties, because the Frosty machine needs electricity, and the pop machine needs electricity. But the flat top, to make the burgers, doesn't need electricity. The fry later needs electricity. We can still make a menu that includes everything you cook on the flat top. I was like, uh, OK, how do we take money? But this was 20 years ago, when we still used cash. So that worked out okay, as long as you can make change in your head and know roughly how much a smoky bacon cheeseburger costs. You can do that. Oh, I have something. Do you have something? Yep, yep, we got it. You got it. Okay, that's exciting. Thank you. So I was like, okay, there's obviously a way we can run in a reduced mode. I can do that. With only a couple data points in your product, you don't know if what you have is just a couple failures or a disaster. With only a couple data points, you don't know if what you have is an everyday level of success or flawless victory. And flawless victory is something that we don't get often, but I think we'd all like to achieve. Thank you. This one? Yeah. So who remembers this? Yeah? NPM is an amazing service, Node Package Manager. They handle all of your annoying dependencies for you, which is amazing. And uh, it's great, and it's sort of smooth and automated, and you don't really think about it. And then this event happened where a developer got angry because of a namespace conflict and pulled out all of his packages. And one of his packages was 11 lines of JavaScript that padded the left-hand side of your code in case there were zeros or, or weird leading spaces. So NPM didn't do anything 
wrong by letting him delete things. That's, that's what you want. Thank you. Yep. Um, but when this tiny program was gone, two and a half million accounts and users were affected because it was broken and it was deep in the dependency chain. So the system was fine, but there was this unseen linchpin. And when you think about it, a lot of us don't realize how fragile it can be to have unseen linchpins and how close we are to one tiny mistake adding up and adding up and adding up and becoming a disaster. So if the opposite of failure is success, the opposite of disaster is flawless victory. Delivering a single success is great. It means your system is working and you have a data point for the win column. And that's what we usually test for and monitor for and observe for. Will the message make it through? Will the system respond? Are things normal? Single success. Flawless victory is when you pile up all the nines together, when all the messages go through, when the system never goes down, when your services all respond instantly, or when there is so much redundancy in your system that no one can tell that you've gone down. This is the Netflix way. It's not that they never lose parts of their system. It's that they have so much system, nobody can tell when it goes down. In the ops sense, it's what we think of as a good day, flawless victory. But in the DevOps sense, this is the goal, and we can never act like we believe in it because Demon Murphy will get you. We're prone to think of success and failure as binary. A test passed or it didn't. The service is up or it's not. That's not how our systems actually work, though. They are always in a state of brokenness. There is always a degree of brokenness to our systems. All we can do is try and make sure there isn't so much brokenness that other people notice. If it's within our acceptable range, we don't think of it as failing. It's a little broken, but it works. So let's look at this drawing again. The area between the lines is our zone between failure and success. I tried to come up with a clever name for, us, for this, but the muse was not with me. It's functional. It's good enough. It's not broken. It's not down. It's not an outage. It's not flawless. It's not perfect. It's not anything that we really name, but that zone between success and failure is where we're really aiming at. This talk was inspired by a really great post on 538 in December of 2016 about how Waffle House handles hurricanes. How they prepare to exist in that liminal state between normal operations and closed. And since it's part of the mission statement for Waffle House that they never close, it's actually pretty hard for them to do. This is an actual Waffle House memo about hurricane prep. I tried to bribe, bribe everyone I know in the South to actually get me pictures or copies of the Waffle House uh, run book, and nobody could do it. The managers all either denied the existence or wouldn't let anybody see it. I'm like, seriously, your top secret waffle redundancy plan? Okay. So I didn't get actual pictures of the run book, but I know it exists because people have seen it. And I don't live in the South, so I couldn't like take a fake job as a waffle cook but I considered it. Uh, I wrote the guy that was mentioned in the article as their uh, resiliency planner, but uh, he didn't write me back because I guess they think that a technology conference wouldn't be interested. I'm like, we're totally interested. The Waffle House men menu has lots of things that are cooked on the flat top. So if they have gas and water, it's a mild pain, but it's not too bad. You can have pancakes, you can have eggs, you can have bacon, no waffles, because the waffle machines are electric. Um, and paying is going to be a challenge, but that's all right. You're going to need to bring in light. That's pretty easy. That's been a solved problem for, you know, a couple millennia. Um, and if you have, still have safe water, you can do all the hygiene you need. As a side note, there are remarkably few open licensed pictures of uh, diner kitchens for whatever reason. If you don't have gas, but you still have power and water, you can have waffles. Or you can have anything that's deep fried, because the fryer later runs on electricity. You're not going to be able to do eggs, but you're not going to have to try and maintain safe food temperatures with dry ice either, so, you know, win some, lose some. 
The worst part is if you lose running water or you can't trust the water to be clean. Because then you need to truck in some porta potties and you need to use hand sanitizer. And I've taken food safety courses and I can tell you that they're 100% based on please bleach your hands every 20 minutes in like a bleach water solution. And it's really difficult to do that if you don't have water. So I'm sure they have a way that they work around that. I'm sure there's an alternate no water method of safe food preparation, but I don't know what it is. Uh, so that one's like the hardest level, I think. And another thing that Waffle House does is prep at the edges. They look and see where the forecast says the storm is gonna hit, and then they position uh, food resupply and fuel resupply and tanker trucks outside that periphery, but right on the edge of it, so that they can come in as soon as the roads are clear. This picture is of an organization called the Cajun Navy. And they are an amazing bunch of normal humans, well, normal Cajuns, um, who take their flat bottom swamp boats into anywhere in the south that's had hurricane style flooding. And they do rescues. And they're like, we have these boats, why would we leave them sitting in our driveway when we could save lives and get people out of bad situations? So they have an alerting system that sets up around them and as soon as they think they can get in close enough to drop their boats in the water, they head out. This is all of them heading out to a hurricane that's in progress, knowing it's going to take them, you know, 12 hours to get there, and by then the hurricane will be over. It's amazing. How many of you saw the eclipse last summer? It came through pretty close to here, yeah? Did you know that every porta potty in the Intermountain West was booked a year in advance for this event? Because here it's not so bad, you have population density. But if you go out to Montana and Wyoming, where the track was, there's a lot of nothing. It's a very exciting nothing, and now with eclipses. But it meant that we were going to have to position things to be ready for this giant influx of people. I thought that was so fascinating because. We're like, what's going to happen? How can we prepare for it in a way that's invisible to most humans? Schools have the same problems on a smaller and more immediate scale. How many of you had kids out of school on Wednesday? Yeah, a bunch. The school was closed because I heard there was a snowstorm. Y'all are not convincing me. I'm from Minnesota. I got here. There's. <sighs> So, and it's a scramble for parents, and schools really know that, so they try to avoid cancellation, but here are their constraints. Lights, heat, water, and transport. Lights aren't that much of a problem if the school doesn't need power for water or heat. A lot of modern schools are constructed so that all the classrooms have natural light, so during the day, you don't actually need the lights to be on. And if you have a boiler, you don't really need uh, power to be on to provide heat. So you can keep the classrooms going. It's harder to do without heat in cold weather. No one functions well when they're cold, and everybody gets hungrier. Oop. Transport. Transport is the hard problem. First, you have to be able to get the buses started. It probably doesn't get that cold here, but it does sometimes in Minnesota. We actually have plugs that go into our cars. This is not a joke. Like, I realize it seems weird, but we do sometimes plug our trucks in at night to keep them warm. Um, you have to be able to open the bus doors. If snow is too deep for you to be able to swing open the bus door, you can't get the kids out. If it is too cold to leave a kid standing at the bus stop for 10 minutes, you can't take the kids to school. Minnesota has, in addition to snow days, we have cold days, where if the standing temperature is 20 below or the wind chill is 40 below, there's no school, even if it's not snowing. I know, these seem like unreal temperatures. It happened like four times this year. Um, it was a cold year. Because you can't leave a kid at the bus stop or they will freeze into a kid sickle. And you have to be able to predict the weather because uh, St. Paul schools made this mistake last, or this January where it was fine in the morning. They knew the storm was coming in the afternoon, but they didn't anticipate how bad it was going to be. So when they started to send kids home, the buses got stuck. 
And the kids were stuck on the buses until the police showed up with their four by fours to extract the children and take them home. Well, that's, that's not really optimal for anybody. And uh, so this year, since January, they've been a little more um, quick to pull the trigger on canceling school. So you have to think about all of those things every time you have any kind of event at school. Like, am I going to have all of these to provide to children? So happily for us, in software as a service, we don't have, like, is it so cold that I cannot operate safely? Um, but we do have problems specific to software as a service, distributed infrastructure, and, you know, the Internet of Tubes. So here are some problem modes that fall in the space between failure and full operation. Uh, some connection. Who here hates some connection? That thing where, like, most of your messages are getting through, or there's poor fidelity in the messages? Um, it's harder to deal with that than absolutely broken. Like, absolutely broken, you just switch over to a different service. You're like, oh, you're down. But if most of your messages are getting through, including all of your, like, status pings, you don't know you need to switch over because it's kind of working. This is a picture of the 2003 Northeastern blackout. It's about regional outages. Works fine on my computer also applies to works fine on my data center, right? We spend a lot of time trying to make sure we have the same things available in different regions, but there's always something that gets forgotten unless you're doing pretty much regular daily failovers a la PayPal. This is the part where I make fun of Delta because I'm still mad about this. I'm so salty. Um, Delta bought Northwest Airlines, which was based in Minneapolis, and decided that they didn't want to run two data centers, so they closed down the Minneapolis data center and went with the one in Atlanta, which was fine until the one in Atlanta literally caught fire. <laughs> so for two days, Delta pretty much didn't have computers, and airlines don't work super well without computers. And I was like, see, I told you, you should have redundant data centers. And they still haven't gotten a redundant data center up yet, but I tell you what, if Georgia keeps up with their shenanigans, we might get a data center back in Minneapolis. <laughs> Slow failures are frequently upstream problems that are super difficult to diagnose. Your load balancers look green, but something is still sending traffic through in bursts and wiggles and trickles, and you can't figure out what it is because it's not on your system and you don't really have insight or observability into other people's systems as much as we'd like to. This is also hard to diagnose because it's not you and because it's not a total outage, so you can't just table flip and go to the next provider. Rolling restores are a great way to get systems back up after they failed, and you should probably automate this for the first time. But if they're automated, sometimes automation doesn't know that something keeps causing the same failure. So you have this cycle where a system goes down and it gets automatically restarted and it hits the same failure condition and it goes down and it gets automatically restarted. And you really need like a human intervention at that point. You're like, my dude, computer. The same thing keeps happening over and over again. Computers like honey badgers do not care. So how do we manage to find that sweet spot between noticeable failure and difficult success? We're going to make our systems more resilient, more capable of handling failure, and coming back from problems. I am the English major most in love with state machines, and I'm going to tell you why. Because they are an amazing way to understand risk and mitigation. It's a machine not because you actually touch it, but because you can use it to do work in sort of the six basic machines of the world. So what are all the possible states your system can end up in? Illuminating that and writing it out seems like a really difficult task. But in all likelihood, someone has already done part of this work. I suggest you go talk to security, um, because they probably already did this for you, because they're responsible for that sort of thing. Um, but somebody knows all the states that your system can end up in. And if they don't, if nobody at your company knows all the possible states of your system, you should fix that because you can't predict and respond to things that you can't anticipate. So once you have the end states, you can identify how the system gets into those end states. And once you define that, you're going to be able to mitigate them. 
the endpoints and transitions together define the state machine. And knowing your endpoints and your transition gives you so much insight into what you're doing. So now that you know what can happen, you can start hardening your system against it. This is much more effective than just committing to do better. Someone once told me in a self-help sense that um, no one is ever going to get better by trying to be better, because if we could have done that, it would already be true. And um, I think this is true. It's not like I'm going to try to be late less often has ever succeeded in the history of time. Um, but I'm going to try to be early to 10 minutes early to every appointment does in fact change your behavior. It's different. Just doing better is not actually an achievable goal. But identifying your end states and hardening them, that's the thing that's possible. So when you have some kind of weird semi outage, what are you going to do about it? Well, you're going to offer reduced service. And that's OK, because reduced service is better than going down altogether. I want you to think beyond the binary of up and down and serve minimum viable products. Like maybe, you, maybe your ad system has gone down. Too bad. I mean, that's the thing that happens. Uh, maybe your animations are broken. Maybe your CSS is broken. Maybe the person on the other end is using a screen reader and cannot see your beautiful uh, clickable graphics. That's a thing you should be able to predict. In any of those cases, you need to be able to, develop, to deliver a bare bones experience that still meets user needs. Talk to business about what bare bones user needs are. Because business is not the enemy. Business is the subject matter experts of people who give us money. They know what it is that we need to be delivering. And every time we fail to ask them what we need to be delivering, we are missing a chance to have a dialogue about what's possible and what's probable, what we should be giving. Theo said this too, circuit breakers are a way to prevent cascade failures, which is really important to all of us because cascade failures are what keeps us up at night. Humans are the slow, fallible meat part of a system, and if you have a problem, you want a circuit breaker to stop it, and then you want to intervene after the first reboot doesn't work. Like, don't wake me up for the first reboot, because sometimes computers are like cranky toddlers and they just need a nap. Um, you'll never convince me that they're not. Uh, but sometimes there's actually a problem and you need to intervene. So, you know, sleep through the first reboot, come back for the second one. Deliver modular projects. This is something that I really believe in because I think we don't understand that when we're breaking up our monoliths, the thing that we're attempting to do is make smaller products that could be delivered individually. We think about microservices, but then we couple them so tightly that they are effectively just like weirdly designed monoliths. I know that you all have had that experience. <laughs> so when you're designing your microservices and your modules, think about how each of them could be their own product. Oops, I already said that. Do feature management. When you have modules that are their own product, you want to be able to turn them on and off individually. And you want to be able to, say, target them and monitor them individually. So make sure that you're making something that is its own thing and that you can turn it on and off. I work for a company that makes a product that does this, but lots of people roll their own pretty successfully. Just make sure you're thinking about using flags to turn things on and off, because it's going to make troubleshooting and resilient delivery a lot easier. I want you to define victory. Because it turns out that while we define failure really accurately and in like a thousand shades of gray, we don't really define victory. So what is your minimum victory state? What is the least you can get away with delivering and still be like not failing entirely? Well, you can just say 
I'm, li I'm, I'm not lazy, I'm in energy saving mode. I'm not serving graphics, but you can still check out your cart. I'm not serving the dashboard, but you can still have the API. Whatever it is that's going to meet the very minimum standards. And the next one is the sort of middle state, the not bad. So the middle state of success is uh, the lazy Halloween costume where you throw a sheet over your kid and they still get candy. Um, you've technically met the minimum requirements and everybody is more or less happy even though your kid actually wanted like a handmade Lego costume, hypothetically. Um, so think about what the middle state of success is. What's like good enough and not like embarrassingly small. And then take some time and think about what best case delivery looks like. What would it be like if you got this entirely right? What kind of pushing party would it be if you did for some brief weird moment have 100% uptime and delivery? How would that even work? Because if you don't define that, you don't have a middle state between that and failure. How can you be victorious without defining victory? How could that even be possible? How can you win if you don't know what winning is? Because as a, a technology industry, we're terrible at this. We are terrible at saying, that was good. We did it right. We are great at saying, not bad. Here are the things we should improve. But we never stop at, yeah, that was pretty awesome. And I think that in order to be both more positive people and to achieve bigger things, we're going to have to raise our sights a little bit and say, would it be possible to achieve this? Because I really want you to be rainbow unicorn pushy. I really want you to be able to get to that level. And you're not going to be able to get to that level if you are thinking all the time about not failing. Success is way more than not failing. Success is so much bigger. So think about what success looks like for you. So if this talk was too long or a little scrambled in the beginning, here are the things that I want you to take away. Too long red Twitter is what that stands for. Um, make failure more nuanced, not just up or down, but like degrees of failure. Make success bigger. Understand that success includes all sorts of upstates. And when you go to Waffle House, despite the name, the thing you are going to order is the hash browns. The waffles are mediocre. The hash browns are out of this world. I'm just it like pro tip, hash browns. So I work for Lodge Darkly. They kindly sent me here. Uh, but I refuse to haul t-shirts. So if you want to take a picture of this slide and um, go to this site, we will send you a t-shirt, and then I don't have to carry anything. So this is my, my life hack. And thank you to the organizers for putting up with my, my exciting um, AV moment. Thanks.